How do nuclear power reactors work? A nuclear power reactor works by generating heat from a controlled fission reaction. Which then generates steam used to drive turbines to generate electricity. The fuel for the nuclear reactor is typically uranium-235 or plutonium-239. How do nuclear power reactors work? A nuclear power reactor works by generating heat from a controlled fission reaction. Which then generates steam used to drive turbines to generate electricity. The fuel for the nuclear reactor is typically uranium-235 or plutonium-239. What is a thorium reactor? A thorium fuel cycle is also possible for use in nuclear power reactors. This involves using thorium-232 to generate uranium-233, which is capable of undergoing fission processes to generate energy in the form of heat. What is a thorium reactor? A thorium fuel cycle is also possible for use in nuclear power reactors. This involves using thorium-232 to generate uranium-233. Which is capable of undergoing fission processes to generate energy in the form of heat. What is a breeder reactor? A breeder reactor is a type of nuclear reactor that is capable of generating fissile material. Material that can sustain a chain fission reaction, faster than it uses it up. This is accomplished by using the neutrons given off in the fission reaction to generate additional isotopes capable of fusion. Typically this involves the use of either thorium to generate fissile uranium or uranium to generate fissile plutonium. What is a breeder reactor? A breeder reactor is a type of nuclear reactor that is capable of generating fissile material. Material that can sustain a chain fission reaction, faster than it uses it up. This is accomplished by using the neutrons given off in the fission reaction to generate additional isotopes capable of fusion. Typically this involves the use of either thorium to generate fissile uranium or uranium to generate fissile plutonium. What is radon? Radon is an element that is widely known for its potential to cause cancer. 
it is the heaviest gas known to man, with a density roughly nine times greater than that of air. It is usually found in soil and rocks, though it can also be found in water. Fortunately, radon detectors are commonly available that allow you to test your home for elevated radon levels. What is radon? Radon is an element that is widely known for its potential to cause cancer. It is the heaviest gas known to man, with a density roughly nine times greater than that of air. It is usually found in soil and rocks, though it can also be found in water. Fortunately, radon detectors are commonly available that allow you to test your home for elevated radon levels. What are some of the worst nuclear disasters in history? A few of the worst nuclear disasters in history are those which took place at Three Mile Island in the USA in 1979, at Chernobyl in the Ukraine in 1986, and more recently following an earthquake in Fukushima. Japan, in 2011. Nuclear disasters are very dangerous if they do occur and the possibility of a nuclear disaster represents a primary reason that some people oppose the construction of new nuclear power plants. What are some of the worst nuclear disasters in history? A few of the worst nuclear disasters in history are those which took place at Three Mile Island in the USA in 1979, at Chernobyl in the Ukraine in 1986, and more recently following an earthquake in Fukushima, Japan, in 2011. Nuclear disasters are very dangerous if they do occur and the possibility of a nuclear disaster represents a primary reason that some people oppose the construction of new nuclear power plants. What is a polymer? Polymers are large molecules, usually made up of smaller repeating units. The word itself, polymer, means many parts in Greek. You probably started thinking about plastics. Like milk jugs and plastic cups, when you read the title of this chapter. Plastics are common examples. But polymers also play important roles in all plants and animals, including you. What is a polymer? Polymers are large molecules usually made up of smaller repeating units. The word itself, polymer, means many parts in Greek. You probably started thinking about plastics. Like milk jugs and plastic cups, when you read the title of this chapter. 
Plastics are common examples. But polymers also play important roles in all plants and animals, including you. What is a monomer? If polymer means many parts, a monomer is one part of that whole. A monomer is a molecule that is attached to many copies of itself to make a polymer molecule. Usually these bonds are covalent, but not always. What is a monomer? If polymer means many parts, a monomer is one part of that whole. A monomer is a molecule that is attached to many copies of itself to make a polymer molecule. Usually these bonds are covalent, but not always. How are polymers different than small molecules? So many ways. Polymer chemistry and polymer physics are big areas of research both in the recent past and today. Because connecting a bunch of small molecules into one big one results in lots of interesting changes. To give you a metaphor, let's talk about pasta. Start with uncooked macaroni and uncooked spaghetti, if you try to move your hand. Through a bowl of uncooked macaroni you won't have much trouble. But if you had spaghetti noodles all lined up and you tried to move your hand through them, in either direction, you'll run into problems. You either need to break the noodles, or you need to carefully thread the noodles through your fingers. Both of these actions require energy, enthalpy in the first case and entropy in the second. Now let's cook those noodles. Stick a fork in each of the bowls and spin it around. With macaroni, nothing happens, but the spaghetti starts to wind around your fork. Gets tangled up, and so on. Macaroni, a collection of small molecules, I mean, noodles, is totally different than polymers. Spaghetti, which are also made up of flour and water, but are much longer. The raw and cooked spaghetti aren't just easy to imagine. They're great ways to think about polymers in different states, solids and liquids, glassy states, and polymer melts. How are polymers different than small molecules? So many ways. Polymer chemistry and polymer physics are big areas of research both in the recent past and today. Because connecting a bunch of small molecules into one big one results in lots of interesting changes. To give you a metaphor, let's talk about pasta. Start with uncooked macaroni and uncooked spaghetti, if you try to move your hand. Through a bowl of uncooked macaroni you won't have much trouble. But if you had spaghetti noodles all lined up and you tried to move your hand through them, in either direction, 
you'll run into problems. You either need to break the noodles. Or you need to carefully thread the noodles through your fingers. Both of these actions require energy, enthalpy in the first case and entropy in the second. Now let's cook those noodles. Stick a fork in each of the bowls and spin it around. With macaroni, nothing happens, but the spaghetti starts to wind around your fork. Gets tangled up, and so on. Macaroni, a collection of small molecules, I mean, noodles, is totally different than polymers. Spaghetti, which are also made up of flour and water, but are much longer. The raw and cooked spaghetti aren't just easy to imagine. They're great ways to think about polymers in different states, solids and liquids, glassy states, and polymer melts. What is a quark? Quarks are the fundamental particles that make up protons and neutrons. As well as several other types of particles. There are six types of quarks, which are referred to as different flavors. These are named up, down, top, bottom, charm, and strange. Protons and neutrons are each made up of three quarks. Two up and one down quark make up a proton. Two down and one up quark make up a neutron. What is a breeder reactor? A breeder reactor is a type of nuclear reactor that is capable of generating fissile material. Material that can sustain a chain fission reaction, faster than it uses it up. This is accomplished by using the neutrons given off in the fission reaction to generate additional isotopes capable of fusion. Typically this involves the use of either thorium to generate fissile uranium or uranium to generate fissile plutonium. What is an antiparticle, and what is antimatter? For most kinds of particles there is postulated to exist a corresponding antiparticle. Which is of the same mass but an opposite charge. These antiparticles have only recently been observed in laboratory settings for the first time. And they are very difficult to isolate and study experimentally. This is because particle and antiparticle pairs collide to generate photons of light in a process that annihilates the particle and antiparticle pair. Antiparticles are not well understood and are an active area of research related to nuclear chemistry. Antimatter is just matter made up of antiparticles. In the same way that normal matter is made up of particles. There has been postulated to be an equal amount of matter and antimatter in the universe. Though the observations made to date do not suggest this to be the case. This represents an unresolved dilemma that scientists hope to someday better understand. These types of fundamental, 
unresolved problems are a big part of the reason science is so interesting. How are isotopes made? Specific isotopes of an element can be obtained in one of two ways. Either by separation of the desired isotope from a naturally occurring sample or by synthesis of the desired isotope. Since the different isotopes of an element all have the same chemical properties, they can be quite difficult to separate. The separation techniques used to separate different isotopes are thus based on their differences in mass. Rather than on differences in chemical properties. Some of the methods used include separation by diffusion in the gas or liquid phases. Centrifugation, ionization, and mass spectrometry. Or chemical methods based on differences in reaction rates due to different atomic masses. Different isotopes of an element can also be generated synthetically. One way to do this is to fire high energy particles at the nucleus of an atom. Depending on the situation, this can either cause a particle to be emitted from the parent nucleus, generating a lighter nucleus, or the fired particle can be absorbed, generating a heavier nucleus. It is also possible to synthesize isotopes of some elements by making use of another naturally occurring nuclear reaction such as when the particles released by one nuclear fission reaction are absorbed by another nucleus how do nuclear power reactors work A nuclear power reactor works by generating heat from a controlled fission reaction, which then generates steam used to drive turbines to generate electricity. The fuel for the nuclear reactor is typically uranium-235 or plutonium-239. What is alpha radiation? Alpha radiation involves the fragmentation of the nucleus into two particles. One consisting of two protons and two neutrons, an alpha particle, or in other words, a helium nucleus and the other consisting of the remaining protons, neutrons, and electrons initially present in the parent nucleus. Alpha decay decreases the number of protons in the nucleus by 2 and decreases the atomic mass of the nucleus by 4 amu. What is the average kinetic energy of a molecule? The average kinetic energy of a molecule is closely related to the temperature of its environment. And this determines how fast the molecule is moving. On average, the speed of any molecule is close to 300 m slash s. Which is equivalent to covering the distance of a few football fields every second. The other important thing to realize, though, is that collisions with other molecules are constantly causing changes in direction. 
which slows the overall distance in a given direction that a molecule travels. How does an atomic bomb work? Atomic bombs, A-bombs, are based on nuclear chain reactions that occur very rapidly. Causing a huge release of energy in a very short amount of time. In early designs, two pieces of uranium would be fired at one another in the core of the bomb. Initiating the fission chain reaction responsible for the explosion of the bomb. As the bomb starts to detonate the core of the bomb expands. And it is necessary that pressure be applied against the expanding core while the fission process takes place. Within a fraction of a second after detonation, the explosion takes place. These are the type of bombs that were used at Hiroshima and Nagasaki in world. War II and are the only nuclear weapons that have been used in war to this day. What is a thorium reactor? A thorium fuel cycle is also possible for use in nuclear power reactors. This involves using thorium-232 to generate uranium-233, which is capable of undergoing fission processes to generate energy in the form of heat. What is gamma radiation? while alpha and beta radiation is the loss of some particle from an atom. Gamma radiation is the release of electromagnetic radiation, called gamma rays. This energy is typically of a high frequency, greater than 1019 Hz. Which means it's high energy, greater than 100 keV, and can cause significant damage. Gamma radiation can easily penetrate deep into your body. Unlike alpha and beta particles, causing damage to your cells and the DNA inside them. Sometimes this damage is useful, though. And some radiation therapies for cancer treatment make use of gamma radiation to kill the malignant cells. What is a positron? A positron is the antimatter counterpart of the electron. It has the same mass and spin as an electron. But with a charge opposite in sign and equal in magnitude to that of the electron. If an electron and positron collide, they can annihilate each other and release their energy in the form of a photon. What types of energy levels exist in molecules? There are three main types of energy levels that physical chemists are concerned with. These are electronic, vibrational, and rotational energies. Changes in electronic energy levels occur when an electron 
undergoes a transition from one molecular orbital to another. Vibrational energy levels are associated with vibrations of chemical bonds in the molecule. And rotational energy levels involve the molecule rotating in space. As you could probably guess, atoms don't have vibrational energy levels since there aren't. Chemical bonds present in single atoms. Physical chemists can often learn about the structure and reactivity of molecules by studying the transitions between these energy levels. What is work? Work is a name used in physics for processes that transfer energy between objects by the application of a force over a distance. Take throwing a baseball, for example. As your arm moves, your hand applies a force in the direction the baseball is moving. During the time the ball is in your hand and moving forward, you are doing work on the ball. The total amount of work done can be calculated as the product of the force you apply times the distance over which you applied force. Once it leaves your hand, you are no longer applying a force, so you aren't doing work on it anymore. What is an ideal solution? An ideal solution describes a solution of dilute solute particles that do not interact with one another. It is very similar to an ideal gas, except that instead of empty space occupying the space between the gas particles, a weakly interacting solvent occupies the space between solute particles. What is the first law of thermodynamics? The first law of thermodynamics is a statement of the conservation of energy. Which tells us that energy can be transferred from one form to another but never created or destroyed. What is radon? Radon is an element that is widely known for its potential to cause cancer. It is the heaviest gas known to man, with a density roughly nine times greater than that of air. It is usually found in soil and rocks, though it can also be found in water. Fortunately, radon detectors are commonly available that allow you to test your home for elevated radon levels. What is quantum mechanics? Quantum mechanics is a branch of physics that is needed to provide an accurate description of objects with very small mass, such as electrons. It does so using an approach that describes matter as being both similar to a particle and similar to a wave. 
the description of a particle in quantum mechanics is contained in something called a wave function. Which can be related to the probability of an object being in any of its possible states. One interesting and counterintuitive thing we learn from quantum mechanics is that for particles with very small mass, the position, velocity, and other quantities defining the state of the particle cannot all be precisely specified at the same time. The wave-like description offered by quantum mechanics is needed to explain why. Molecules have discrete energy levels, along with many other experimental observations from physical chemistry that are inconsistent with classical mechanics. Are all isotopes stable? Not all isotopes of a given element are stable. For example, tin has 22 different known isotopes, 10 of which are stable and 12 of which are unstable. Though there is some debate about just how stable those 10 are. Stable is, of course, a relative term. Usually when one says an isotope of an element is stable. It means that it has a decay half-life that is too long to be measured by current methods. There are some elements, such as technetium, radon, and plutonium that do not have any stable known isotopes. In fact, no elements with an atomic number of over 83, i.e. more than 83 protons, have any known isotopes that are considered to be stable. How is nuclear chemistry related to the alchemist's goal of transmutation? Alchemists sought a way to turn common metals into gold. Which we now know is not possible to do in any simple way. The reason is that transmutation would involve converting one element into another. Which can't be done by simple chemical processes. It would require a nuclear reaction to take place, either a heavy nucleus would have to divide into a gold nucleus and another byproduct, or two lighter nuclei would have to combine to form one of gold. Neither of these things happen readily. If early alchemists had recognized the distinction between more ordinary chemical reactions and the nuclear reaction they were looking for, it would likely have saved a lot of time and effort. What is a monomer? If polymer means many parts, a monomer is one part of that whole. A monomer is a molecule that is attached to many copies of itself to make a polymer molecule. Usually these bonds are covalent, but not always. What holds nuclei together? The nucleus of an atom consists of neutrons, which are unchanged argued, and protons, which are positively charged. 
while the unchanged arg neutrons don't feel an electrostatic attraction or repulsion to other particles. The positively charged protons should repel each other. In fact, this repulsive force between the protons is quite strong. Because protons in the same nucleus are very close together. Thus the force that holds them together must be a very strong force. Indeed it is, and it's even named the strong force. This strong force acts only over distances on the order of 10 to 15 m a very very short distance. If the protons were to become separated by a more substantial distance, the strong force would decrease in magnitude faster than the repulsive force, and the protons would be pushed apart. It's also often said that neutrons act as a sort of glue to help bind all of the neutrons and protons together. Since there seem to be favored relationships between the number of neutrons and protons present in stable nuclei. Do electrons, protons, and neutrons all have the same mass? Protons, neutrons, and electrons each have different masses. Electrons are, by far, the lightest of the three. With a mass of only about 1 slash 2000 th that of a proton or neutron. Protons and neutrons have similar masses. With that of the neutron being just slightly higher than that of the proton. The masses of the three particles in kilograms are, electron mass. 9.1094 x 10 to 31 kilograms proton mass, 1.6726 x 10 to 27 kilograms neutron mass, 1749 x 10 to 27 kilograms. How is radiation used in medicine? We should begin by pointing out the distinction between radiation used in nuclear medicine slash radiopharmaceuticals, more akin to the other topics of this chapter, and electromagnetic radiation, light of different wavelengths. Nuclear medicine is the branch of medicine most closely tied to the concepts of nuclear chemistry discussed in this chapter. Diagnosis via nuclear medicine typically involves the injection of a radiopharmaceutical into the body. And the radiation released by this drug can then be monitored to gain information about organ function. Blood flow, the location of a tumor, or to locate a fractured bone. In some cases, the use of nuclear medicine can allow. For earlier diagnosis than with other imaging techniques. In terms of using electromagnetic radiation for medical applications, perhaps one of the first treatments that come to mind is radiation therapy, which is used to fight against a broad range of cancers. This involves using focused electromagnetic radiation to damage the DNA in the tissue of a tumor while hopefully not causing too much damage to the surrounding healthy tissue. The goal is to damage the DNA of cancerous cells so that they are unable to reproduce. Hopefully killing the tumor with time. 
beams of radiation are focused onto the tumor from different angles to minimize the effect on any one area of healthy tissue. Rays and CT scans are two commonly used, non-invasive medical techniques that make use of electromagnetic radiation to take pictures of what's going on inside the human body. It should be noted that prolonged exposure to the X-rays used in these procedures can be harmful and are capable of causing cancer themselves over long periods of time. What is a polymer? Polymers are large molecules, usually made up of smaller repeating units. The word itself, polymer, means many parts in Greek. You probably started thinking about plastics. Like milk jugs and plastic cups, when you read the title of this chapter. Plastics are common examples. But polymers also play important roles in all plants and animals, including you. What is a beta particle? Beta particles are another type of particle that can be emitted during a nuclear decay process. A beta particle can be either an electron or a positron, which is the antiparticle of an electron. If it is an electron being emitted, one of the neutrons in the nucleus must become a proton to conserve charge in the process. Beta decay increases the number of protons in the nucleus by one and leaves the atomic mass essentially unchanged. What's the difference between an H-bomb and an A-bomb? The hydrogen bomb, H-bomb, is actually significantly more destructive than even in a bomb. While A-bombs release energy via chain fission reactions, breaking apart heavy nuclei. H-bombs release energy through fusion of light nuclei. This energy comes from an overall increase in stability. Due to the strong force that holds nuclei together as the light nuclei fuse to create heavier ones. To give an idea of the relative powers of these two weapons of mass destruction. Consider that the A-bomb dropped on Hiroshima had a force on the order of 10 kilotons. Explosive force equivalent to 10,000 tons of TNT while a common H-bomb has a force on the order of 10 megatons. Or 1,000 times the explosive force of the A-bomb used at Hiroshima. What is entropy? Entropy is a measure of the total number of microstates in a system. There have been two widely used definitions of entropy. Which were suggested by Ludwig Boltzmann and J. Willard Gibbs. We'll just look at the one specified by Boltzmann. Since it's a little more straightforward to understand. The equation for Boltzmann's definition of entropy is, S equals KBLN, in this equation. K 
kb is Boltzmann's constant, and is the number of microstates accessible to a system. To get an idea of how entropy works, consider the example of rolling one or more six-sided die. On the first roll, there are six possible outcomes. So the entropy associated with rolling one die is KBLN, 6. If we roll two dice, there are 62 equals 36 possible outcomes, and the associated entropy is KBLN, 36. For 3, it's 63 equals 216 possible outcomes, and the associated entropy is KBLN, 216. As you can see, the number of outcomes for statistically independent events grows very rapidly. Exponentially, with the size of our system, which is also true for molecules. By taking the logarithm of the number of outcomes, we make the entropy scale linearly with system size. While the number of possible outcomes slash configurations grows exponentially with system size. The entropy grows linearly, which means that if we double the system size we double the entropy. This property makes entropy fall into a category of variables known as extensive variables. Which just means that they scale with the size of a system in this simple way. What effects cause deviations from the ideal gas law? Deviations from the ideal gas law occur due to intermolecular forces between the gas particles as well as the fact that gas particles do actually occupy volume. There is a modified version of the ideal gas law, C atoms and molecules, called the van der Waals equation of state. That uses constants specific to each molecule or atom to adjust for these factors. Deviations from ideal gas law behavior become more important. At relatively high pressures and slash or low temperatures. What is the zeroth law of thermodynamics? The zeroth law of thermodynamics states that any two systems, call them A and B, that are each in thermal equilibrium with a third system, call it C, must be in thermal equilibrium with each other. Thermal equilibrium implies that the systems must have the same temperature. And therefore systems A and B must have the same temperature. This might seem totally obvious, but it is what puts our use of thermometers. To compare the temperatures of different objects on a sound footing. If object C is our thermometer, we can use it to compare the temperatures of other objects. What is heat? Heat is responsible for all types of energy transfer. Other than those that fall under the definition of work. One easy example to think about is ice cream melting on a hot day. Because the ice cream is at a lower temperature than its surroundings. Heat flows from the surroundings to the ice cream, causing its temperature to increase, and eventually it melts. 
there are lots of other examples of heat flow too. It's a pretty big category since it covers all types of energy transfer that aren't defined as work. What is the third law of thermodynamics? The most common statement of the third law of thermodynamics is that the entropy of a perfectly crystalline system approaches zero as the temperature of the system approaches zero. Recall from macroscopic properties. The world we see that a perfect crystal is a regularly ordered lattice of atoms that exist in a repeating pattern in three dimensions with no defects or irregularities in the lattice. This is equivalent to saying that a perfectly crystalline system has only one accessible state as the temperature approaches zero. In truth, this isn't always strictly true since there can be multiple low energy states that all have the similar energy, but let's ignore this for now. What are some of the worst nuclear disasters in history? A few of the worst nuclear disasters in history are those which took place at Three Mile Island in the USA in 1979, at Chernobyl in the Ukraine in 1986, and more recently following an earthquake in Fukushima, Japan, in 2011. Nuclear disasters are very dangerous if they do occur and the possibility of a nuclear disaster represents a primary reason that some people oppose the construction of new nuclear power plants. What are particle accelerators used for? Particle accelerators are used to generate beams of particles moving at very high speeds. Which are typically then collided with matter or other particles to learn about fundamental interactions. Most of the time the particles in question are subatomic particles, though atoms can also be used. Such experiments are used to address fundamental questions. In physics surrounding the structure of matter and space. Typical modern particle accelerators are several kilometers long. With some operating in a linear fashion and others in a large ring. How do nuclei spontaneously decay? Nuclei can undergo several types of decay through spontaneous means without colliding or interacting with nuclei of other atoms. The most common types of nuclear decay are called alpha radiation, beta radiation, and gamma radiation. These differ by the type of fragmentation the nucleus undergoes during the decay process. How are polymers different than small molecules? So many ways. 
Polymer chemistry and polymer physics are big areas of research both in the recent past and today. Because connecting a bunch of small molecules into one big one results in lots of interesting changes. To give you a metaphor, let's talk about pasta. Start with uncooked macaroni and uncooked spaghetti, if you try to move your hand. Through a bowl of uncooked macaroni you won't have much trouble. But if you had spaghetti noodles all lined up and you tried to move your hand through them, in either direction, you'll run into problems. You either need to break the noodles, or you need to carefully thread the noodles through your fingers. Both of these actions require energy, enthalpy in the first case and entropy in the second. Now let's cook those noodles. Stick a fork in each of the bowls and spin it around. With macaroni, nothing happens, but the spaghetti starts to wind around your fork. Gets tangled up, and so on. Macaroni, a collection of small molecules, I mean, noodles, is totally different than polymers. Spaghetti, which are also made up of flour and water, but are much longer. The raw and cooked spaghetti aren't just easy to imagine. They're great ways to think about polymers in different states, solids and liquids, glassy states, and polymer melts. What is the second law of thermodynamics? There are several different statements of the second law of thermodynamics. But they are all centered on the idea of identifying what things can happen spontaneously in nature. One formulation of the second law states that, for a closed system. The entropy of the system can only increase or remain the same. In plain language, this says that nature favors having more accessible configurations or arrangements. It's why, for example, a drop of ink in water tends to spread out to Fill its accessible volume but won't spontaneously reform a drop of ink. Another statement of the second law says that heat cannot spontaneously flow from a colder body to a warmer body. Work would have to be done for this to happen, which would imply the process was not spontaneous. Are all polymer chains the same size? No. Let's stick with the macaroni metaphor to understand this. Imagine you're stringing noodles together to make a macaroni necklace. You can put as many noodles on a single string as you want. If you have two strings, you can put an equal number of noodles on each string or make one longer than another. Again, the macaroni noodles are monomers, which form polymers when we string them together. Are all polymer chains the same size? No. 
Let's stick with the macaroni metaphor to understand this. Imagine you're stringing noodles together to make a macaroni necklace. You can put as many noodles on a single string as you want. If you have two strings, you can put an equal number of noodles on each string or make one longer than another. Again, the macaroni noodles are monomers, which form polymers when we string them together. So if all polymers are not the same size, what is the weight of a polymer? Good question. If we know the number of monomers that make up a polymer chain, technical term, degree of polymerization, then the molecular weight of the polymer is the molecular weight of the monomer multiplied by that number of monomers. So if all polymers are not the same size, what is the weight of a polymer? Good question. If we know the number of monomers that make up a polymer chain, technical term, degree of polymerization, then the molecular weight of the polymer is the molecular weight of the monomer multiplied by that number of monomers. How do you measure molecular weight of a polymer? The most common way is based on size. The technique is known as size exclusion chromatography, or gel permeation chromatography. The sample is passed through a column that has a porous solid material. The smaller polymers can work their way into those pores. While larger molecules don't interact with the solid material. The biggest molecules, because they don't interact with the solid phase. Come out of the column first followed by smaller and smaller molecules. The time it takes for a polymer to get through the porous column is related to its molecular weight. Okay, technically it's based on the hydrodynamic volume, but let's let this approximation slide. In practice, these instruments are calibrated using standard polymer samples of a known molecular weight. How do you measure molecular weight of a polymer? The most common way is based on size. The technique is known as size exclusion chromatography, or gel permeation chromatography. The sample is passed through a column that has a porous solid material. The smaller polymers can work their way into those pores. While larger molecules don't interact with the solid material. The biggest molecules, because they don't interact with the solid phase. Come out of the column first followed by smaller and smaller molecules. The time it takes for a polymer to get through the porous column is related to its molecular weight. Okay, technically it's based on the hydrodynamic volume, 
but let's let this approximation slide. In practice, these instruments are calibrated using standard polymer samples of a known molecular weight. What is molecular weight distribution? We just talked about the fact that polymers can have different molecular weights. Oftentimes in reactions that make polymers a range of molecular weights are produced. The molecules may be composed of the same repeating unit, monomer. But for a number of reasons the chains are different in length. It turns out that this distribution of lengths is important to a number of polymer properties. The details of how this number is calculated are not worth going into. It's sufficient to know that a higher molecular weight distribution means that there is a larger spread of polymer chain lengths. A distribution of 1.0 would mean that every single polymer chain has the exact same molecular weight. What is molecular weight distribution? We just talked about the fact that polymers can have different molecular weights. Oftentimes in reactions that make polymers a range of molecular weights are produced. The molecules may be composed of the same repeating unit, monomer. But for a number of reasons the chains are different in length. It turns out that this distribution of lengths is important to a number of polymer properties. The details of how this number is calculated are not worth going into. It's sufficient to know that a higher molecular weight distribution means that there is a larger spread of polymer chain lengths. A distribution of 1.0 would mean that every single polymer chain has the exact same molecular weight. Do polymers have stereochemistry like small molecules? Yes. The most common example is polypropylene. This polymer has a methyl group attached to the backbone of the polymer. If the methyl groups are all on the same side of the chain. The stereochemistry is known as isotactic, top structure below. If the arrangement of the methyl groups alternates which side of the chain it's on. The polymer is called syndiotactic, bottom structure below. If there's no order at all to the substituents, we call the polymer atactic. Do polymers have stereochemistry like small molecules? Yes. The most common example is polypropylene. This polymer has a methyl group attached to the backbone of the polymer. If the methyl groups are all on the same side of the chain. The stereochemistry is known as isotactic, top structure below. If the arrangement of the methyl groups alternates which side of the chain it's on. The polymer is called syndiotactic, bottom structure below. 
if there's no order at all to the substituents, we call the polymer A tactic. Are all polymers linear chains? No, and this is another way that chemists classify these really big molecules. The major types of polymer shapes, technical term. Topology, are linear, branched, and cross-linked networks. Linear polymers are chains of monomers joined together, like a noodle or a rope. If there is a point along a polymer chain where a second chain starts, like a fork in the road, this arrangement is referred to as branched. Are all polymers linear chains? No, and this is another way that chemists classify these really big molecules. The major types of polymer shapes, technical term. Topology, are linear, branched and cross-linked networks. Linear polymers are chains of monomers joined together, like a noodle or a rope. If there is a point along a polymer chain where a second chain starts, like a fork in the road, this arrangement is referred to as branched. What is a cross-linked polymer? When a bond is formed between two polymer chains. And technically not at the chain ends, the product is called a cross-linked polymer. Creating linkages between chains usually increases their viscosity. So more like molasses than olive oil, and creates elastic properties like those found in rubber bands. At higher levels of cross-linking, polymers can even become stiff or glassy. What is a cross-linked polymer? When a bond is formed between two polymer chains, and technically not at the chain ends, the product is called a cross-linked polymer. Creating linkages between chains usually increases their viscosity. So more like molasses than olive oil, and creates elastic properties like those found in rubber bands. At higher levels of cross-slinking, polymers can even become stiff or glassy. What polymers are found in nature? There are a ton. Proteins, enzymes, cellulose, starch, and silk are all polymers. What polymers are found in nature? There are a ton. Proteins, enzymes, cellulose, starch, and silk are all polymers.
Is DNA a polymer? It is. DNA contains two long polymers of sugars, called nucleotides. Attached to each sugar molecule are phosphate groups and a nitrogen base, technically a nucleobase. The sequence of these nucleobases encodes the information in DNA. For more on DNA, see the biochemistry chapter. Is DNA a polymer? It is. DNA contains two long polymers of sugars, called nucleotides. Attached to each sugar molecule are phosphate groups and a nitrogen base, technically a nucleobase. The sequence of these nucleobases encodes the information in DNA. For more on DNA, see the biochemistry chapter. What is cellulose? Cellulose, see diagram below, is linear polysaccharide dash polyformeny and saccharide means sugar. So cellulose is a chain of sugar molecules. It's an amazing molecule, it's the most abundant organic compound. On the planet because it is the main component in plant cell walls. Cellulose is highly crystalline because of the way the sugar molecules are connected and because of the fact that it's made up of a single enantiomer of glucose. Like polypropylene, highly crystalline polymers like cellulose are very strong strong enough to make trees stand up straight. What is cellulose? Cellulose, see diagram below, is linear polysaccharide dash polyformeny and saccharide means sugar. So cellulose is a chain of sugar molecules. It's an amazing molecule. It's the most abundant organic compound on the planet because it is the main component in plant cell walls. Cellulose is highly crystalline because of the way the sugar molecules are connected and because of the fact that it's made up of a single enantiomer of glucose. Like polypropylene, highly crystalline polymers like cellulose are very strong strong enough to make trees stand up straight. Is starch different than cellulose? Starch is also a polysaccharide, like cellulose, but it is much less crystalline. The major component of starch is amylopectin, which is a highly branched polymer, while cellulose is strictly linear. These branches prevent amylopectin from crystallizing as well as cellulose. Starch is an excellent source of energy, or stored sugar, for plants and animals for these reasons.
because it is less crystalline than cellulose it is more soluble than cellulose. And the branched structure also means there are more end groups at which enzymes can start chewing the polymer apart. Is starch different than cellulose? Starch is also a polysaccharide, like cellulose, but it is much less crystalline. The major component of starch is amylopectin, which is a highly branched polymer, while cellulose is strictly linear. These branches prevent amylopectin from crystallizing as well as cellulose. Starch is an excellent source of energy, or stored sugar, for plants and animals for these reasons. Because it is less crystalline than cellulose it is more soluble than cellulose. And the branched structure also means there are more end groups at which enzymes can start chewing the polymer apart. What is rayon? You probably know what rayon fabric looks or feels like the best Hawaiian shirts. And much of 1980s fashion, were made of it. What's fascinating about rayon is that it is not really a synthetic or a natural fiber. Rayon is a chemically modified cellulose polymer, first prepared in the 1850s. While there have been a number of ways of preparing this artificial silk. The viscose method led to the first commercial production of rayon. This method treated cellulose with a combination of Sodium hydroxide and carbon disulfide as indicated below. What is rayon? You probably know what rayon fabric looks or feels like the best Hawaiian shirts. And much of 1980s fashion, were made of it. What's fascinating about rayon is that it is not really a synthetic or a natural fiber. Rayon is a chemically modified cellulose polymer, first prepared in the 1850s. While there have been a number of ways of preparing this artificial silk. The viscose method led to the first commercial production of rayon. This method treated cellulose with a combination of Sodium hydroxide and carbon disulfide as indicated below. What is the rate constant for a reaction? The rate constant for a chemical reaction is a quantity that describes how rapidly the reaction proceeds. Rate constants can have different units, depending on how many molecules are involved in the reaction. Consider a simple reaction where a single molecule of a species A becomes a molecule of species B. The rate of the reaction will depend on the concentration of species A denoted A, present, and the rate constant, K, for this reaction. The rate equation for this reaction would be 
reaction rate equals Ka this tells us that the reaction rate depends only on the concentration of A. And that the reaction rate will increase as the concentration of A is increased. In truth, the reaction rate also depends on the temperature, pressure, and perhaps other factors as well, but these are all bundled into the rate constant, K. What is nuclear fusion? Nuclear fusion is the process by which two nuclei combine to form a single, heavier nucleus. Energy is usually released when two lightweight nuclei fuse. Though for heavier nuclei, fusion generally requires an input of energy. Nuclear fusion can be used in bombs to cause a massive and rapid release of energy. Fusion is also responsible for the fact that stars burn bright and give off light and heat. What is osmosis? Osmosis is the movement of solvent molecules in a solution to Establish an equal concentration of solute throughout the solution. Solvent molecules move from areas of low solute concentration to areas of high solute concentration. Which tends to remove any gradient in solute concentration. <laughs> 